Okay, just getting focus. You know what? I think I want to try lens with a little bit more character. Does it always do that? Okay. Looking at me funny. It doesn't look good. Uh, looks good, just very vintage. I'll be honest with you. I think vintage lenses are overpriced and overrated. So why do I have so damn many of them? Yes, that's right, in this episode, we're gonna take a look at my vintage lenses, the pros and cons of ownership, which are my favorite and why. First, for those not familiar with the vintage lens craze, the principle is simple. You purchase old photography lenses from places like eBay and Facebook groups. You modify the mounts yourself or via a third party to fit your new video camera. And hey presto, you're filming on vintage glass that can be anywhere from 10 to 80 years old, perhaps even older. But why would you? I mean, what is it that vintage glass gets you that modern glass does not? Well, firstly, vintage glass in some circumstances can be very affordable. Uh, modern photography or cine lens might cost you over a thousand dollars and well beyond. While the vintage prime lens of the same focal length made 30 or 40 years ago might only be a few hundred dollars or less. So the ability to build out an entire lens set for your camera at a fraction of the cost can be very appealing for any aspiring indie filmmaker. But the answer really goes back to one of my other videos discussing our never-ending quest for the film look. New high-resolution cameras, by their very definition, get it, are sharp, razor sharp, crisp, and sometimes even with all that soft beauty lighting, they can be extremely harsh and unforgiving. Every wrinkle, every texture, every blemish, divot and scar on someone's face that you might be trying to hide is right there for the whole world to see. Think about every imperfection or mistake in your special effects makeup, every stray seam on a wig, every crease in your not entirely accurate period costume, every styrofoam block in your freshly painted set that's actually meant to be a cave. All of it is now being rendered in harsh, pristine 6K resolution with nowhere for the movie magic to be concealed. Filmmakers are becoming the victim of the ultra high quality of their own cameras and it can really suck the soul right out of your image. Back in the days when things were shot on film and not rendered in 6 or 8K, this was much less of an issue. Film has a way of smoothing over those imperfections while digital has a way of highlighting them. However, we are all slaves to technology and its convenience. Film is now impractical to film on. From the costs of processing film stock to the additional lighting required and the laborious and much slower process of shooting with it on set. And the size and cost of the cameras that must be used to shoot on film. It's all just a lot easier to pick up a tiny cube and hit record. <laughs> 
So as technology advances, so too must we find creative ways to bring back this feeling of film in a digital era and to mitigate the unforgiving nature of high resolution images. Cinematographers all over the world are constantly looking for ways to make their digital cameras not feel so, well, digital. And one such way is to use vintage lenses. The most common word used to describe vintage glass is character. And by character, what they really mean is a little more like film. Whereas my previous video discussed using the Dehancer plugin to bring back the film look, another way for you to get something that looks less sharp and clean is to try vintage lenses. Old lenses have old glass. Old glass has imperfections. These imperfections lead to strange and sometimes interesting elements being introduced back into your image. From swirly bouquet to chromatic aberration, interesting flares, vintage lenses will constantly surprise you. And often this old glass just renders skin and overall detail in a softer, more pleasing way. There are many factors at play in vintage glass, the type of older, less modern lens coatings these lenses used, and the way the glass elements were fitted and constructed, even the glass itself. Through the passage of time, some of these lenses have aged like fine wine, where even the deterioration of the elements are now actually considered beneficial and pleasing to the look they create. This is part of the character they add and how these imperfections seem to directly offset the unwanted sharp digital look of the modern cinema camera. So what's not to like? Well, honestly, quite a lot. The same thing that is seen as beneficial in a vintage lens is also the same thing that often works against it. Firstly, camera lens manufacturing has come a long way in the time between post-World War II Russia and now. So before you purchase that Helios 44-2, you have to remember what those advancements mean for modern lenses. We now have better lens coatings, better control of flares, better sharpness, better construction, more responsive controls, and even, yes, autofocus. It's almost like buying a car from the 1950s. Yeah, it looks cool, but it probably runs like shit, and the handling sucks. There's no power steering with vintage lenses. All those compromises add up when you're on set to what can be a very frustrating experience. When your client complains that the footage looks too soft, you can't educate them on the idea of character. Vintage lenses often just don't work in certain filming environments. These lenses were designed for old photography cameras, not your Blackmagic Pocket 6K. So fundamentally, you are asking them to do something they were not designed for. They won't electronically provide your camera any information. You'll struggle with the manual focus, which might be sticky or too loose depending on your copy. You can only change the aperture and hard stops, and we haven't got into the subject of things like fungus and haze sitting behind one of your lens elements, quietly ruining your shots. Then there's the modifications required to get these lenses working with your camera. These solutions can be expensive and introduce another failure point when filming with them. In short, vintage lenses are not very practical. But aside from the increased difficulty in using them and the sometimes mixed results you get in environments that reveal their imperfections and age just a little too much, the real problem with vintage lenses in 2022 is just how overpriced they've become. And I'm sorry to say, but it's YouTube who is to blame. And yes, dear viewer, people like me making videos like this. You see, it used to be true that most vintage lenses were quite affordable. After all, these lenses are old, out of date, and often not in particularly good condition. Everything about them has been superseded by the technology of modern camera lenses. 
So naturally, part of what you're looking for in a vintage lens is a more affordable option, which takes into account their flaws. The problem is that with each popular vintage lens essay on YouTube, the value of these lenses creep up. A whole new group of people flock to eBay and drive all the prices skywards. These inflated prices mean that many types of vintage lenses are now more expensive than their modern day counterparts, even though those modern day counterparts function as better lenses in almost every way. This kind of defies the logic of the appeal of vintage lenses, which in part are due to their good value for money. People are paying astronomical sums for vintage glass that does not actually function very well as a lens on their camera. But we ignore this fact purely for the prestige of calling ourselves a vintage shooter. An even more curious variation of this overpricing problem is in the rehousing of vintage glass to make it more practical to use on modern cameras. Now I completely understand why you'd want to make the filming experience better when using this glass. What I don't understand is paying thousands of dollars for this rehousing process when the ancient glass inside that housing is worth only 60 or 70 dollars. Essentially that rehoused lens is still producing the exact same image regardless of what housing it's in. But in doing this rehousing process you have spent more on it than you would have buying a modern cinema lens with glass worth thousands of dollars. Think about that. <laughs> now, I'll freely admit that I have absolutely been curious as to what vintage glass could do for my image. I own a cheaply rehoused Helios 44-2, the 58mm Russian prime lens, which has become synonymous with the vintage look. And while I agree it absolutely does bring character and interesting bokeh to your image, it is also very soft at f2 with a slightly too narrow focal length and is definitely not easy to use. I also own a contact Zeiss 50mm which offers a pleasant cool neutral look but is very prone to washing out completely when light sources are pointed near it. My Carl Zeiss Jenner 35mm 2.4 was by far the most versatile of my oddball assortment of vintage lenses and worked well enough with the contacts, but the image it produced is still not superior to any of my modern lenses. I've also previously owned a Zeiss 20mm Flictagon, a Super Takamur 35 and 50mm, a Russian Mur 37B, all of which I found underwhelming to the point of selling shortly after I brought them. Of all these lenses I found the same issues. They were hard to use and the characteristics they provided were never really enough not to simply go for my modern lenses. In fact many projects would be made worse by trying to get these quirky lenses to perform in a way my clients were accustomed to. And even in my own projects the over stylized characteristics would be running a high risk of calling far too much attention to themselves and distracting viewers through the use of these lenses. Cheap vintage lenses perform like cheap vintage lenses, poorly. Except a lot of cheap vintage lenses have now become expensive vintage lenses and yet that performance hasn't changed. And that's where I thought my love affair with vintage glass and this particular YouTube craze would end. That was until I was introduced to the vintage Leica R lenses. The Leica lenses are sort of known for being vintage and yet not as vintage as some of the other lenses on the used markets. From my understanding there are three sought after types of vintage Leica Rs. The Sumalux versions which are astronomically expensive, a thousand dollars plus and are not really affordable for mere mortals, but they have the lowest f-stop of 1.4. The Sumacron versions are also not cheap apart from the 50mm due to the number of copies of it readily available online. The Sumacrons have an aperture of f2. And then finally there's the Leica Almerits. Uh, these are the most affordable of the Leica R series and they have an aperture of 2.8. 
and can be purchased off eBay for generally between $300 and $1,000 at the time of recording. While the more expensive Leicas have a lower f-stop, it's never really been clearly shown that they produce a much superior image than the more affordable versions. And it appears what you're really paying for is those extra stops of light and the fact they are less readily available. Leica serial numbers start in the hundred thousands and work their way up. The first three digits being what you really need to pay attention to. Higher serial numbers represent newer versions of the lens and are more expensive. Older versions are cheaper and have a more vintage, less modern feel to them. The lenses were manufactured between the 1960s and early 2000s. My Leica serial numbers fall in the mid to late 200,000s and this puts them somewhere in the middle of the manufacturing run in the late 70s and early 80s. It's important to note the closer you get your serials, the more likely they are to match across the different focal lengths in terms of performance, coating and colour rendition. If you want to know more about the history of Leica lenses, Kevin Reyes and the 60 Second Film School have great deep dives on the subject which I'll link to in the description. I picked up my first Leica, which is my only Simracron, purely as a curiosity. It was going very cheaply online and I just couldn't resist dipping my toe back into the vintage waters. And just as I got out of collecting vintage lenses, they pulled me back in. The 50mm copy I received was good, no fungus or haze and a smooth aperture ring. I loved the look it produced, but I couldn't afford the other Simracrons, so I went down to the Almeritz, searching on eBay looking for a 35mm. That also impressed me, and I went on to get a whole set, adding a 24mm, the 28mm and the 90mm to finally complete my lens set. I am missing a 19mm, but this lens is so rare and sought after the cost of purchasing it would be more than all the other four lenses combined. I realised it's probably better for me to just step back a couple of paces if I wanted the 19mm field of view so desperately. Use your feet to change your focal length kids, not your wallet. Think about that! <laughs> I converted all of them to EF mounts and added gear rings for control with a follow focus using the Simod lens adapters. They are by far my favourite lenses to use, at least in terms of the image they produce. It's hard to quantify why I like these Leicas so much more than the other vintage lenses I've tried, or even the modern glass that I own. Whatever character they have just seems to complement my Red Komodo or Pocket 6K in a way that is hard to explain. Some lenses just pair perfectly with some cameras. There doesn't seem to be any true explanation for it. Some cameras and lenses have amazing chemistry, and some don't. All I can say is my Elmerit Leicas seem to take away the fundamental problem I have always had with the quote unquote red look. The sharpness, the skin tones and colour all just look so much nicer when I put one of these Leicas in front of the camera. In other words they seem to undigital my image and get me closer to that elusive holy grail, the film look. Another huge bonus of these Leicas is that they were designed for full frame photography cameras. That means these lenses will cover full frame video sensors as well as Super 35mm. This makes them quite versatile and adaptable when swapping between the various camera bodies and saving on what you might pay for modern full frame glass, which is always more expensive than the Super 35mm or ASPC lenses. This is particularly useful when I use my Canon Speed Booster with the Red Komodo, because using it with these Leicas means I get an extra stop of light and that full frame field of view that I so dearly love. And if I stop using the speed booster, it's like I have an entirely new lens set, as all my focal lengths change due to the 1.33x crop, which essentially gives me two lens sets in one. 
It is important to note that the 24mm can't focus to infinity when using the speed booster due to its rear element protruding too far. This means if you like using the speed booster it's probably not worth purchasing the 24mm. I think I was fortunate with my lens set in that although some of my serial numbers are not very close, I've found that in terms of colour they all seem to match really well. Their size is also something that makes them a great companion for the Komodo as they are compact and light and when pairing the two you end up with a very small footprint that is great for a portable handheld option. Their build is really solid with metal construction and if you get a good copy their focus throw is also very smooth. In terms of my favourite or most used lenses of the Leica set it's going to be the usual suspects, the 35mm and the 50mm in particular get the most use. So if you're looking to buy I would start with them. But I would also say that I absolutely love the 90mm for faces and close ups. And in terms of my least favourite I would have to say the 28mm seems to be missing something the others all have even though historically the 24mm is known as the cheaply designed one of the set. Now I don't want to suggest these lenses are perfect. Despite the gear rings and conversion to EF mount they are still much more difficult to pull focus with than a regular cine lens or for that matter many newer photography lenses and the flaring and chromatic aberration and halation the lenses produce in some circumstances make them unsuitable for corporate filming. The 2.8 f-stop is also a limitation when you're just itching to open the aperture up just a touch wider. And finally for most folks the main problem is they are not cheap and only getting more expensive by the day. There is also a pretty substantial hidden cost in buying the EF converter rings and gears from Simod which I did not anticipate. So in terms of value for money as a lens set the value to cost ratio is kind of debatable. The good news is that if you buy them now it's likely you'll be able to sell them for the same if not more if you don't like the image they produce. So it's certainly one of the smarter investments you can make in terms of camera gear. As someone who fell in love and then quickly fell out of love with buying vintage lenses these Leicas have once again made me a believer. They make for the best lenses I have used with red cameras. Should you be interested in going vintage they are certainly my pick and have become a permanent part of my camera kit. Or to put it more succinctly, I like it. I like it a lot. If you've enjoyed this video or found it helpful please consider giving it a like and subscribing and if you want to support the channel please consider watching my new feature film Older which is available on Amazon Prime and Tubi for free. Links in the description. So what's your favourite lens? Let me know in the comment section. Do you have a favourite vintage lens? And if you want to see more lens comparisons to my right you might see a comparison video featuring every lens I own if I finished it. As always I am the Savage Filmmaker and I'll see you when I see you.